you are very excited and, and just, just felling here a little bit to introduce our final panel. EOI's founder, Charles Fries, recognized that high quality teaching materials would be essential to the success of his enterprise. And he made sure that EOI's initial funding included resources for their development. <clears throat> And that's really when a tradition was born in which teachers developed materials based on the latest research, which were then often adapted into textbooks, which in some cases have gone on to be used by, by literally millions of teachers and learners around the world. Um, some of them uh, Keith referred to in the last, in the last session. Uh, multiple people have referred to those today. So in today's closing panel, we are going to celebrate, we celebrate we, we, uh, some of the most uniquely successful of these texts that have been developed at ELI. And these are ones that have truly stood the test of time. Stretching back to the 1970s, these texts are all still in print, published by one of our most important part and enduring partners, the U of M Press. And leading this panel is our, is our dear, dear friend, frequent collaborator, Kelly Sippel. Kelly is the Press's Executive Acquisitions Editor for Applied Linguistics and ESL and Director of its ELT division. In addition to more than 25 years in textbook publishing, Kelly has also taught composition and grammar courses herself and served as chair of the material writer's interest section at TESOL. Uh, she has her, also herself co-authored two EAP reading textbooks. Kelly is deeply knowledgeable about the full range of research in applied linguistics and English language teaching and has been directly involved with many of the important texts to come out of ELI. Please welcome, thank you, Kelly Sippel. I see. Sorry, I thought it was the old slide. Okay, good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Um, so we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna break the genre a little bit, just in the interest, because it's the end of the day, and because this is really about telling some stories. Um, so I wanted to start a little bit by saying that um, I was thinking after last night and hearing people talk about their stories, that my journey started. Um, one day when I was in middle school and my dad, who was a secondary school teacher, brought home the teacher's edition of a textbook that he had just been assigned to use. And the teacher's edition had the little pages of the student book and then all these notes in the margin to the teacher and the answers were in red. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like Nirvana. This is Nirvana, and and um, I could I was just you know enraptured by the thought that this existed, and that night at dinner I peppered my parents. My mom was also a secondary teacher, like in saying things like, um, "So the book tells you what to do, right?" And they said, "Well, not exactly. The book supports us," and that concept where the books are designed to support the teachers but not do all the teaching is something that I've taken with me um, in my role at the University of Michigan Press um, because we get a lot of weird questions from customers sometimes who seem to think that the books should be magic and they should do all these magical things and really they need teachers but we're very proud of our history of publishing textbooks um, in the field of ESL. And um, anyway, as I, you know, as you can tell, like I actually was one of those people who grew up wanting to be a textbook editor. And here I am. And um, it's an absolute honor to be moderating this panel today. Uh, so we're going to talk about the origins of these landmark texts and then about their impact. That's basically we're dividing this into two sections and you're going to hear from the panelists twice or maybe, um, well, we'll see how it goes. But the, the goal was to talk first the origin stories of these products and then later talk a little bit about their impact. Um, so uh, because some of what they're going to talk about when they talk about the origins will involve who they are, I'm not going to do introductions. Uh, as Chris said, like John needs no introduction. I mean, Joan Morley needs no introduction. Authors of Reader's Choice need no introduction. Um, but I will say this, that um, I consider these five of the most influential textbook authors in the field of English language teaching over the past 45 years. 
Joan Morley, Sandra Silberstein, Mark Clark, Chris Feek, John Swales. The contributions that their books have made to the field are enormous. And certainly, there are others in this audience today who came out of the ELI who've also published books. Thank you very much. Um, but And may all your books live forever. Um, so we're going to go in chronological order here. And um, I feel like it's necessary to say that before we can actually start talking about Joan's listening books and Reader's Choice, both of which came out in the 70s, uh, we have to mention the Rainbow series. Now, it's been mentioned. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, others. Um, because the story of textbooks at the ELI starts with Charles Fries and the Rainbow series, although I learned last night from Peter that it didn't always have that name, but that's the only name I ever knew for it. Um, so, and I can tell you that English Sentence Structure, which Keith referred to as the Green Book, although there was actually an earlier Green Book, uh, is still in print, and it still sells a re very respectable number of copies. They are all in Central and South America right now, but um, it's impressive. And in 2017, ESS will be, have been on the market for 60 years, and it has never been um, updated. So I guess that's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. But it's still selling a respectable number of copies because it's still really, really good. Um, so as we think, let's, I'm going to take you back to the 1970s. You're thinking about ABBA. You're thinking about Watergate. If you're in Ann Arbor, you're thinking about the 10-year war between Bo and Woody. Um, and you're thinking about, how do I teach listening to my English language students? So we're going to have Joan talk now. And then right after Joan, Mark, and Sandy will talk about Reader's Choice. OK, thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. And I must say, um, well, on behalf of the panel here, that thank you all for staying. The best is yet to come. <laughs> so. My topic is how I got into the textbook writing industry. Okay? Okay. My home state is Colorado, as I mentioned last night. And um, one of, uh, I believe it's the most beautiful state in the Union, of course. I'm from Greeley, Colorado, and I graduated from the University of Northern Colorado. But when I graduated, it was CSCE which was education, right? right. <laughs> and then it became modernized and it had to become a university, so it became the University of Northern Colorado, and that's where I went to school. When I graduated, I took a job in a city named Richland in the state of Washington. It was way down in the southeastern corner of Washington, and it was a closed town, that is, it was a company town because it was there for the people who worked in the Hanford Atomic Energy Experimental Station. We never knew exactly what they did out there in the desert. Richland was a, a very interesting city because it was a closed city. There was no one allowed to move into that town but the people who worked at the Hanford and service people such as us but I had to be investigated to get there to teach. I had to be investigated by the uh, FBI. I had to be fingerprinted uh, to even go and teach in this closed town. So right away, it made a very interesting experience. I was in Richland four years, and I worked in 10 different schools. I was an itinerant speech correctionist, and that meant I moved from school to school. I had 10 schools. Monday morning, I went to school one. At noon, I had a brown bag lunch in my car. And in the afternoon, I was in school two. Tuesday, school three, brown bag lunch in the car. Afternoon, school four. And so on and so on. And then one afternoon, I was talking with my roommates, and I said, there's got to be more to life than eating a brown bag lunch in my car every day. So I decided, uh, and my two roommates, roommates did uh, also, that we wanted to go back to graduate school. So we got brochures from all across the country. We thought long and hard, talked together. 
One of my roommates went to UCLA, one went to Ohio State, and as I said last night, we are still friends. And I was the luckiest of all, because I went to Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I did at Michigan when I uh, went there, I joined a program called the TEP. I don't know if anybody here from Michigan remembers what the TEP was. Teacher Education Program. It was sponsored by the government, and it was uh, kind of an ambassadorial kind of program, I think. There were 35 or 40 different teachers from all over the world. I had to go home at night and get out my atlas because I hadn't even heard of some of these countries. And it was the most wonderful experience I have ever had. It was what really sold me on being a person who wanted to go into this career. They were wonderful teachers from everywhere. And there were two Americans. There were two people who were returning from Peace Corps and me. The rest were all teachers from all over the world. And so I had a wonderful, I had a wonderful experience with them. And then I received my degree from the speech department at the University of Michigan. And I began to uh, do my work at the English Language Institute after I took the TEP. And I had a lot of good books uh, in uh, reading, writing, grammar, and so on. But I was very interested in listening, and there were no books in listening. Somehow it was the forgotten skill, and I have uh, said this in a couple articles that I've written. And uh, with my friend Mary Lawrence, whom some of you may remember, remember, we decided we wanted to do textbooks. Mary wanted to do one in writing, and I wanted to do one in listening. So we trotted down to the office of the director, who was Ronald Wardoff. I don't know how many of you remember him. He was a very specific kind of person. And we said to him, Mary and I, that we would like to write these textbooks and that we wish that we could have reduced time from our classes so that we could write the textbooks. So he said, mm, we'll think about it. So a few days later, he called us down, and he said, yes, here we go, but I want those manuscripts on my desk by XX date. So Mary and I went back to our office, and we sat down, and we looked at each other, and we said, oh, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> But we, want to work, we went to work on it, and we finally got it done. And uh, that's when we had our first association with the wonderful University of Michigan Press. And I can't say enough about the helpfulness of everyone I have ever worked with from the University of Michigan Press. I think I want to give my own hand to the Michigan Press. when they made corrections, they were very kind about the corrections, even if they made us change format and so on, they were very helpful about it, and I cannot say enough about them. Well, my favorite book was my first one. I think, I, I have three, I think, on the, on the book display out here. Uh, improving Oral Comprehension, Writing Dictation, and Improving, um, what's the third one? Spoken English. <laughs> All oh, right. Improving oral comprehension was a very interesting thing to write. It's one thing, and much, this is something that Mary and I talked about, it's one thing to write a few lessons for your classes, it's another thing to do a book. And we found that out the hard way, but again, with help from other people, we were able to do it. But uh, a lot of people aspire to doing a book when they've done a few lessons. But if you think about it, think about it very carefully because it's a long, long road to be able to do that. Uh, improving oral comprehension. Let me see here. Improving oral comprehension, the last information I got from the uh, press was that it had sold 70,000 individual copies. And I thought, 70,000 people have held a book that I have written in their hands. 
and it almost made me cry. And as I've said several times here at this meeting, my mother told me never to cry in public, so I can't cry. But 70,000. And then I thought, I had this thought. Um, how about I get that 70,000 together in the big house? <laughs> and with the, uh, well, well, they make a pretty good, they make a pretty good crowd in the, in the big house. <laughs> and we'd pipe in on the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 the sound system. We'd pipe in, repeat after me. <laughs> And we'd do some exercises. <laughs> anyway, I had a great fantasy about that. But I, I just can't be, couldn't believe that 70,000, almost 70,000 people had something that I had written. And that just right now gives me a little eerie feeling up my back. So I say, uh, if you are intending to work on a textbook, it's very, very rewarding to know that you have done something like that. Um, I think, let's see, listening, doc, uh, listening dictation had 51 and a half thousand sales, and I could put those in the other corner of the big house. <laughs> and let's see, intensive consonant pronunciation pr practice didn't do so well, so we won't put those in the big, in the big house. <laughs> in conclusion, and I will conclude, I'm going to give you a quotation from President John F. Kennedy. And um, I'm going to give you the name of the book because this is a very, very good little book you might like to think about buying. It's called Presidential Wit and Wisdom. And it's more than 250 classic quotes from America's greatest leaders. It really is a very wonderful book. It's published by Hallmark Books. And I think you would really enjoy it. And um, the quotation that I want to, to give you from this is something that's very precious to me. I think it expresses what our profession is all about. And this is what he had to say. One person can make a difference, and everyone should try. And I think Looking at the people here, we have made a difference in thousands and thousands of lives. And I'm thinking, uh, I wanted to introduce my friend, Helene New, because she helped me in the early days with the listening. I came and went to her class. They were one of the, she had books that had one of the very few uh, times when I, they were listening exercises. So I wanted to recognize her. She has made a difference. Everybody, Peter and Nan have made differences. Everybody I see looking out here, Larry has made differences. Everybody has made differences. If you think about thousands and thousands of people's lives you have touched. Thank you. And remember, I also had the quotation last night from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When you give a public presentation, be sincere, be brief, and be seated. <laughs> I always say if we had um, the royalties uh, from China of those thousands of people whose lives we changed, we'd be really rich. <laughs> you know, what we ask in um, discourse analysis is um, why here, why this, why now? So um, in a couple of minutes, I want to um, try to talk about um, why at Michigan, why, why then, why this book, in our case, Reader's Choice. Um, when I came to the English Language Institute to teach in 1971, um, we were really palpably and excitedly on the cusp of change. Um, people think that change happened overnight. It was at least a decade, but the level of palpable excitement was remarkable. So that the rainbow books were still being used, at least in the summer, and then, um, and then we had Jones, you know, speaking and listening, and Mary Lawrence's um, writing as a thinking process books that were being beta tested. But if you started teaching in the summer, you didn't get to use them because they weren't there. Um, so, uh, but reading and grammar were really 
conspicuous gaps. And I think that that explains some of what happened. When I uh, directed the teacher education program in 1976, I asked both a virtuoso pattern practice specialist and a communicative um, grammar person to teach. Um, the virtuoso pattern practice person was um, a person named B. Sutherland, who it turns out, unbelievably, was Elaine Tyrone's aunt. Um, and the communicative grammar person was, was Diane Freeman, Diane Larson, our own Diane Larson Freeman, was uh, teaching something new and exciting, which was grammar in a communicative way. Um, in TESOL 2013, Diane and I gave a paper on repetition, and in my part, I thought about what does it mean for B skills to be entirely lost? You know, we don't have people who could do any kind of simple drill. And not all of those drills were meaningless. Mark's um, description in the last session of requiring people to wake up and give real answers was typical. That's how people were trained. I was actually shocked, by the way, to read the teacher's edition many, many years later of an audiolingual book I'd been taught with and to discover you were supposed to talk about culture. Um, but um, the other piece that I like to share with people is that um, the shift to communicative language teaching was really driven by practitioners. You know, we imagine a field in which the theorists and the researchers drove everything. But um, here's a quote I like to use from Sandra Savignon, who describes being an audiolingual teacher of French in the 1970s. And she says, how then were students to achieve accuracy and ease when they were thinking about the families they had left at home and we were rehearsing dialogues between Louis and Marie about sausages and rice? What would happen, I asked myself, if we were to begin with meaning rather than grammatical structures? So that was from teachers in the field asking for us to be doing something different. Um, and at that moment at ELI, it's, everything seemed possible. Um, we knew we were the oldest, we knew we were the first institute, we knew that the faculty at other applied linguistics institutes like UCLA had been trained here. Um, and this made us intellectually fearless. Um, I should say, you know, Larry, you were talking about Pete Becker um, the other day. Pete Becker said to me early on in my graduate training that um, there are probably brilliant people everywhere. But somehow places like Michigan persuade ourselves that we're the center and then we do these remarkable things. So no matter where you are, persuade yourself you're at the center and do remarkable things. Um, so, um, for example, if we took on a new project, we, we'd solved it here. And we would write what, what we called a white paper. And that's how um, Mark and I came to write our paper toward a realization of psycholinguistic principles in the ESL reading class, which was reprinting in a number of volumes. Um, and so if CLT was a corrective to audiolingualism, what we did in active and interactive reading was a corrective to both grammar translation and the absence of reading in ALM, um, in audiolingualism. Um, and we did, um, and, and, and for years we saw books in a sense copying us, which made us realize that we really had made a difference. That going from reading that was just a grist to do something else, reading was something to talk about or to write about, and the fact that you could actually think about what it meant, as Mark says, to have conversations around texts was actually quite different. So that was the context in which um, Mark and Barb Dobson and I and several other people including um, Ellen Bober and Margaret um, Geer Baudouin Metzinger, who have both passed on, sadly, um, came to sign up for a materials development course. And I'll tell you um, in a minute how we came to write this book. It's a very quick and um, irreverent story. But um, we thought we'd share briefly how we saw each other when we first saw each other. I, we were in these tiny cubicles, and they give me this guy with a crew cut. You know, we're all hippies. This guy has just returned from Saudi Arabia. Um, and um, I didn't know it was for economic reasons. He went to Kansas twice a year and paid $2 for a haircut. Um, but I assumed that there was nothing I could possibly have in common with this person, Mark Clark. And um, you thought? 
So uh, there was this annoying little Jew from New York who uh, smoked a great deal and had uh, all sorts of um, strange opinions. It took me a long time to discover the meaning of words that she was using, ideology, politicize. Um, it just was a, a totally different experience for me. I uh, grew up in a family, I didn't know there were Democrats. Uh, <laughs> And I came to uh, Michigan where another uh, TA told me she didn't know until she got to college that there were Republicans. So it was, a, it was, an, intense, it was an intense environment. It was, very, um, it was very personal and it was very um, important that as we believed in what we were doing and that it mattered. So I think that was part of the times. So um, we signed up for this materials development course. Um, there was an upper level section and a beginning level section. There were two instructors. I don't like to say their names because we behaved so terribly to them. But um, we find Mark kept saying, when do we write the book? Um, which um, was taken first as charming, and then it was taken as naive, and um, then it was taken as unrealistic, and finally, I think, um, quite annoying. You know, we were going to write little exercises. And every time Mark said, when are we going to write the book, I would say, yeah. Um, and um, so finally, we decided that our instructors were interfering with our education. Uh, and so and this, is, this really is terrible, but true. Um, every time they would tell us what room we were to meet in, we went to another room. Um, so that for a period of months, the instructor could not find us. Um, and we met very conscientiously. And by the time we resurfaced, we had written a sample chapter on a prototype for a book. And um, to Doug Brown's credit, because, I mean, he could have failed us after all. This was a course, which we had not attended. Um, uh, he said, um, I will introduce you to Wally Sears, who was the head of the University of Michigan Press at that time, and um, urge him to give you a contract. Um, so um, that is, in fact, how um, the, uh, the book came to be written. And there's a lot more we could say about it, but we'll, um, we'll spare you that. But Mark, do you want to talk about any of the people who, in, who influenced us at that time? Well, uh, Sandy mentioned the fact that um, there was a palpable sense of, uh, of change and of um, autonomy and of agency. I, I think we were, um, well, we were definitely riding a wave that, was, that could be seen elsewhere in retrospect. I think that uh, uh, the Goodmans were nearby. They were at Wayne State. And I was doing my dissertation in, in reading. Um, and they emphasized uh, the importance of uh, looking at miscues, at, at, at errors that revealed the uh, reader was making sense of the text, not just uh, barking the words that they saw in the tense. This was the, that was the whole language and phonics war. We also had the uh, Chomsky-Skinner uh, wars going on. Um, Roger Brown at Harvard was doing research on three children. Um, a very a, a distinct contrast to the kinds of language acquisition studies that had been done up to that point. Here were three children that we got to meet in the course of his uh, and his colleagues' discussion of, um, um, of, of learning, of, of language learning. More particularly to us, the, the bag lunches that the ELI had brought everyone to town that was doing anything in the field. And uh, so we had du uh, Dulay and Burt, we had, well, our own Diane Larson Freeman was one of the visitors, Earl Stevick, David Harris. David Harris, uh, who was an alum of Michigan and the ELI, um, was a, a big influence on us, worked with us um, on a number of occasions, um, ended up uh, being on my dissertation committee as well, but he, was, he, he took a, a personal interest in our efforts. And um, in the course of this uh, work, Ron Wardoff said something to the effect about a, a, a committee never wrote a book. Uh, Doug Brown, uh, Tom Scoville read Doug Brown's uh, comments last night at the gathering, and that was his, his reference was to that event we made a large poster which we hung in the um, in the office that said a committee never wrote a book, and then we sat there and wrote the book. And uh, David Harris commented, "Well, what about the King James Bible?" So uh, it, there, there was <laughs> there were a lot of uh, 
different <laughs> views on what, on what we were doing. I think that um, we owe a big debt to Doris Wilcox Gilbert, who wrote a book for native English speakers called Breaking the Reading Barrier. I never met her, but we used it uh, in, in the courses I was teaching in, in um, Saudi Arabia, um, which uh, took specific uh, focus on, on skills. We, we borrowed that format and adapted it. Um, David Eske was uh, a, a big help and a, a promoter of, of the work we were doing. Um, so I, I think I'm getting to our I'm, I'm getting to our colleagues. Yes, the the, the key, all of those people were the experts that were in our world and, and that 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 came to town and helped out and and uh, gave us their blessings and their support. But we had this marvelous group. I think several people have mentioned uh, the lecturers and the TAs at the ELI. Uh, Betsy Soden. Uh, was a, uh, a strong supporter of our work and, and taught the book as it was being developed. Um, uh, we had uh, numerous uh, uh, people who were classroom testing, uh, classroom testing the materials, and I think it was that that camaraderie and, and goodwill. People would take the materials, they would they would teach what we were developing, and then they would give us feedback on what worked and what didn't work, and the questions the students had, and that sort of thing. So I'm watching Kelly because she's moving paper <laughs> over there. But uh, I, uh, I can't emphasize this enough because um, I didn't know that Nubs was a, was a scruffy little building. <laughs> I didn't realize that we'd been tucked away in the corner of campus and that there were all these political battles going on. For me, it, it was the it was the, um, the the birthplace of who I was to become as a professor. And it was because of all these people. It's a great experience. OK, so we've got to jump forward now to the 90s uh, to get to John and Chris. Um, so we're going to skip past Madonna and Purple Rain and um, the 1984 Tigers. Yay. Bless you, boys. Um, and now it's the 90s. And in the 90s, um, the world is introduced to two phenomenon. Seinfeld and AWG. <laughs> and they both brought important phrases into the lexicon. So where in Seinfeld we got yada yada, in AWG we got Imrod, and with Seinfeld we got Festivus, with AWG we got the RP, with Seinfeld, we got double dipping, and with um, AWG, we got GS texts and SG texts. And finally, where Seinfeld made Spongeworthy famous, AWG made Cars famous. So now we're going to hear how John and Chris, how this wonderful book came to be. So I haven't been here very long. Sometime in the fall of 1985, when the, the dean of LSA and the senior associate dean called me into their office, and the dean said to me, I don't understand, Professor Swiggles, why the ELI spends all its time on helping strangers when we have so many of our own who need help. Good point, dean. And so we phased out the intensive program and we introduced a small suite of six English for Academic per courses, mostly for graduate students. Karen Madden was the course coordinator, I was responsible for the academic writing course book, and Joe looked after the pronunciation with the lecturers like Carolyn, Sue, Maya, and Betsy doing the other ones. When we look at the programs, materials that were more suitable for, for graduate students than undergraduates, there wasn't very much there. But we uh, put uh, course packs together, and I was responsible for academic writing one, as it then was, and uh, I, I did some new material, I bought some material from England, and I also used a few bits of material from a, from a course that my colleagues in, in Birmingham had done under contract for the British government to supply a book on uh, te technical, 
technical English from 75 polytechnics in Bengal. And in the wider world, though things were moving from our perspective, if you're interested in academic discourse and how it might be taught, um, already, um, Selling Collection and Shrimble, Trimble, get up in Seattle and the Washington School, had uh, done a lot of really important work in ex explaining how technical English worked. The uh, fields like the sociology of knowledge and the sociology of science had, had, had taken a discoursal turn in the, in the 70s and 80s so that you could find many more analyses of scientific texts. And there were people like Charles Bazelman, who were also very interested in the rhetoric of knowledge. After a few years of fiddling with our course packs and so on, Carolyn Madden came and said, why don't you and Chris Feek write a textbook? And uh, so AWG was born. We had eight units, three preparatory, one on data commentary, one on summary and critique, and two on writing a research paper. And we worked from the outside in. Chris worked on units one and two, and I dealt with the research paper, and then we gradually filled in the rest. And the influences on us were um, Carolyn and Jim Samuda and some others interested in task-based learning, so we were able to make it tasky. We had a background in grammar, and so we introduced some language focus around the, in between the tasks. We adopted a genre-based approach, and we both believed that we should make it uh, as based on research, on discoursal findings, as we could. There were times when we skated on pretty thin ice in that respect, but at other times it And so we also began to work towards helping our student participants, you know, the users of the book, become themselves amateur and part-time genre and discourse analysts. Because making participants focus on form as well as content would be a useful transferable skill that they could always employ in any further situation. Because we believed that after all, our job was to improve writers and not just their presence. Thank you. Well, there are always two sides to a story. Um, John makes it sound like it was quite a deliberate act for me to be involved in AWG, but for me it was about the most unlikely thing that would ever happen in my life. Uh, I never wanted to be a writing teacher. Uh, hated writing as an undergraduate and tried to do as little writing as possible, but when I first got to the ELI, nobody wanted to teach writing, and if I wanted a job, I was going to have to take all the leftovers. Uh, taking all the leftovers, however, was probably the most fortunate thing that ever happened to me professionally because it did allow me to work with John. But I, I think I would disagree with him that I was brought in on the project because I had any particular amazing expertise. I knew how to use the computer better. <laughs> I, knew, I knew how to create a file, I knew how to underline things, I knew how to italicize, and I knew how to save it and then find it again. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, despite all the fancy words on John's cards, um, I, I, I appreciate that story though. Um, but, but John and I have, I, I'll be really honest, I think we had a, a kind of a steep learning curve because I had just come from Cornell and like other places, we were teaching writing, but there were no materials, so we made our own. And I was very fortunate to come out of an environment where, uh, as a graduate TA, um, teaching academic writing, something I was very fearful of doing, um, I was expected to pull my weight in the group. We had no materials, and if I was going to be the TA, I had to create materials alongside everybody else. So, um, just like John talked about this morning, about uh, hammering materials out on the table with Tony D Dudley Evans, we were hammering materials out uh, in somebody's office, and I was asked to create my own materials. I would bring them to the group, they would critique them. 
well, made critique is actually quite nice that they would tear them apart, basically. Um, and I dreaded those, those meetings at times, but I also realized that I could go into the classroom with confidence, which is something that was mentioned earlier um, by Donald Freeman, I believe, right? Confidence, right? Confidence, right? And, and I might not have been the best materials writer, but I thought I could do it, and I had confidence, and I didn't know how much I really didn't know, thank goodness. Um, but like a lot of other teachers, I had drawers full of materials, um, but those materials were really directed at students. And as was just said earlier, it's really hard to uh, take those materials that are directed at students and put them into a textbook because your audience is completely different. We're writing textbooks for teachers who are the ultimate uh, deciders on whether a textbook is going to be used or not. And I remember having a many conversations with John. Some of them were a little tense at times, I believe, um, when we would disagree on certain things. I notice the eyebrows are going up. We don't need to go into the details, but I asked him one day, why, are, why would anybody want this book? I, mean, I, I was fresh out of graduate school. I was not coming out of this wonderful environment where it seemed like a very natural thing that you would take your work and put it into a textbook. And the thing that John said was, well, if we write it, then other people will create graduate writing classes. And he was right. I, I was skeptical. I thought, oh, come on, you know? Um, but it, it's very much like that field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. And John, John could see that this was the case, that there were many programs that needed materials, wanted to offer something for students. And um, they had no materials, but they didn't want to take the risk or lack of confidence to actually create it. So AWG came out. Um, I think we probably had about 25 different drafts of my first units, maybe two of John's, and not so much to offer um, at that point, but through the process of working on these units together, building it from the outside in, by the time we got to the middle unit, which was the uh, problem solution unit. Um, we got that done in about four drafts, and I suppose having a deadline about a month away was also a motivator, but by that time, we had, I had learned um, from John what it meant to write for someone other than myself or my students. I also had a much better idea of what it meant to be a materials developer and the kind of thinking that had to go in it. So if you write it, they will come. Um, and this has been uh, borne out over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many times. So although the speakers have mentioned a little bit about the impact, we're going to transition to that um, here. But I do want to say that um, I, I have worked on two editions of Reader's Choice with Mark and Sandy and Barb and two editions of academic writing for graduate students with John Chris. But I never had the good fortune of working with Joan Morley. Um, but one time she took me to lunch at the Gandy Dancer and we ordered sherry after our lunch and it was so exciting to me. I was like, I'm a real editor now. Uh, <laughs> drinking at lunch. <laughs> I never do that now. Um, now you pay. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, and, but I also I think that those numbers that Joan quoted are low. Um, based, I think there, there, there are some years on the statements, well, it's too long of a story, but anyway, those numbers are low, let me just say that. Um, in terms of the, the, the thing that I think we really have to acknowledge is that the kind of longevity that we're talking about with these books is really something amazing. And in some ways looking forward to the future or even the current state of textbook publishing, it makes me sad that I don't know how much longer things like this might continue because the publishing world is changing so rapidly when it comes to textbooks. But I, I, I want to sort of echo something that a couple of, well, that Joan had said and Chris said is that successful textbooks don't just happen. They benefit from some luck along the way probably but it's a team effort led by the authors and their knowledge of the material and how to teach it. And writing good materials and successful textbooks requires creativity and some serious skill. No one knows better, to, better than an editor um, that these folks make it look easy, but if everyone could do it, everyone would. And 
uh, there's a lot of people who say, oh, wouldn't it be a great idea to do a textbook on this? Sure, but then I never get it. You know, they never submit anything, they never do it. And so you have to want to do it and you also have to be skilled at it. Um, and any of you who have written a textbook in the audience or on the panel know how much time you've carefully crafted certain exercises and exercise items and the distractors to make sure that you produced, that what you produce would result in learning. And I mentioned, so I mentioned that great textbooks take luck, but one other feature that's true is that um, you have to know when to break the rules. And I feel like one of the reason these people are sitting up here is because they, they did that. When John and Chris wrote their answer key instructor's manual in 1994, which they insisted, rightly so, um, that it be called a commentary, not an instructor's manual or teacher's edition. But they wrote for one exercise that they disagreed on what the answer was. Are you kidding me? When people first told me this when I came to the press, I'm like, well, you, that must be wrong. And they're like, no, they disagree. And they were so excited. Isn't this great? Um, because and the, the, they thought it was like this cool thing that, what do you mean the authors disagree? Like, is that allowed? And we found out that there were some teaching of writing programs that adopted the commentary as their textbook because of the way that it talked to teachers about writing. It respected them. In my 21 years at the press, I've met a lot of customers and attended a lot of conferences, and I don't think I have been to one event where someone did not make a point to tell me how one of these books <coughs> meant them, either as a teacher or a student or both. Uh, and it was sometimes frightening how well people knew these books. When we were working on the third edition of Academic Writing for Graduate Students, someone came up to me and asked me if I was changing page 162. <laughs> I had no idea what was on page 162, and she was appalled. What? It is the best thing I've ever seen in a textbook. Don't change it, or I won't use the new edition. Chris, do you know what was on page 162? No. Oh, 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 the table. The table. High frequency reporting verbs in different disciplines. It's in the third edition, to be sure. Not on page 162, but it's in there. Um, so, uh, like I said, we're, the press is very proud to have had sm a small role to play, and I'm proud to have been involved in the editions that I've been involved in. Um, and we've heard a lot about the impact of these texts, but I know that um, at least Sandy has some um, things she'd like to talk about in relation to the books, and I'm going to just sort of, in the time remaining, open it up to whoever wants to chime in and tell any stories related to the impact of their texts. Uh, two stories, but I'll tell the lady who's um, really a professional one first, I guess. Um, in my text um, on oral comprehension, I decided I didn't want to use a teacher's manual that told the teachers how to do it. So I wrote it into the text to the student. And I said, your teacher may want you to put these in order of something or other. I wrote all the instructions into the text with a note similar to, your teacher may want you to. And some of them I put in the footnotes and some of them were right in, right in the text. And that way, um, teachers could use the book without any, any problems at all. And then of course someone took me to task at a meeting one time and said, why are you telling us how to teach these books? Mm -hmm. So you can't win. <laughs> and the other, other little story I just have to tell. I've been itching to tell this. At the old um, North University building, there was this corridor that ran all the way around and then a central room for meetings and so on. And the stairs came up over here. Well, one day I was walking down the hall and I turned the corner just here and there was a young woman standing there. And she looked at me and she said, you're Joan Morley. And I said, a little bit warily, yes, I'm Joan Morley. And she said, thank goodness. <laughs> and I thought, well, thank goodness, I like being Joan Morley. This was Diane Larson Freeman, who was then just Diane Larson. But I had the wonderful privilege of attending her beautiful wedding a few years ago. 
So my good friend and special person, Diane Larson. <laughs> So here's another story about Joan. She, she used to produce uh, these first editions, I don't know what book it was, in a little closet that was a, a mimeograph or, no, no, what was the other one? Ditto. 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 What was the purple one? Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember all of the details, perhaps you do, Joan, but you came out of there <laughs> <laughs> with, with paper and purple stuff all over, and there was a student there who says, crazy lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I'm answering a different question, uh, which was, you know, why do you think um, there's, there's some longevity? And um, I hadn't thought about it until Kelly said it, which is what we all do is, in fact, break genres. And another thing that Pete Becker once said was, genres announce themselves by breaking the genre. So, um, anyhow, I think um, one of them was that, that Reader's Choice respects um, and speaks directly to teachers and students. We also did that, you, your teacher may want you. The problem Mark discovered was a different one. Not that the teacher was, was angry at being told how to teach, but that, that the students started telling the teachers how to teach. Um, which was frankly part of the goal, but, um, but still. Um, in our case, the structure is unique, that, that we have um, these um, sort of focused, generalizable skills that we then map onto readings. So we pull them out and then we put them back um, into readings. The fact that we read so many genres, so we're as likely to do a menu or a train schedule as um, a biology textbook or popular press but we're always trying to get people to think about what it means to get meaning from a text and what are the strategies that allow you to do that. Um, and we have this mantra, the text determines what you do with it. Um, you know, I watch my, te my, my, my TAs teach and they, they, they have to teach from such terrible books. It kind of breaks my heart sometimes when I watch it. And I always say, if you see a textbook that has the same thing in every chapter, so, all, all a multiple choice, one main idea, three details, and one something else. You know, I, I just say, danger, danger. Um, what we do with the text has to do with what someone would do with that text in the world. Um, and, that, and one of the, the things that we break, and I'm not sure anybody else does this, is if we have an exercise, we could have a couple of true-false questions and a couple of open-ended questions and a, a couple of multiple-choice questions. We don't understand why you would do the same thing just because um, it's called comprehension. Um, and um, so, you know, if we, we have an article on tourism. And um, I developed a simulation game. You know, you're the minister of education and you need um, money to run the schools, but you're the minister of the environment and it's gonna destroy the environment within 10 years if you have all these people coming in. Um, if um, we did, um, there's an article on lying and um, Mark wrote this um, incredible set of situations that are quite hilarious. Um, about would you tell the truth in this situation? And I workshopped it recently, and a student from China afterwards said, oh my God, you people have been lying to me this whole time. <laughs> and, um, and they said, what do you mean? And she said, you mean that um, if, if somebody made, and they said to her, what do you mean? If someone made you a terrible meal, and, and they asked you how it was, you would tell the truth? And she said, well, I'd say something like, it's not the best, but I would, I'd never say it was okay. Um, so we try and create these situations that real people would engage with, and we do what real people would do with text, which means that they're all really quite different. Um, we try and be critical and relevant and honest. Um, so we think about what it means to study English, what it means for all these other languages to be lost. Um, you know, we read about GMO crops. Um, we try and have students be critical um, in their lives. Um, Mark has this wonderful phrasing that reading is conversations around texts. So we try and um, promote collegial interactions around texts that matter and around texts that are common in the world. This is the kind of thing you actually would read 
as opposed to the common sort of uh, the fruit genre of ESL textbooks. What other interesting fruits do you eat besides oranges? Which is actually a question from an ESL textbook I love to hate. Um, and um, we try and encourage people to have a tolerance for ambiguity. Um, so our textbooks, before John and, and Chris, they would say, the authors disagree on this answer. And we choose texts that make us argue. You know, if we have a really good conversation and we can't agree, and we're, then, then we say, oh, this one will be great. And then we have something called heavy on the answer key. If, so we try, and when things should be clear, we say they're clear. Then we say there may not be, there may be more than one correct answer, be prepared to defend your choices. Um, and then we share, you know, what we thought and why. And finally, um, I, I, we're not soulless, we have a sense of humor. Um, we really try and have a kind of quirkiness. Um, and I remember once Mark wrote a question that was a true false question that was really funny. And um, the thing that was great about classroom testing is you always knew where students were because maybe students are working on their own and you're having trouble figuring out when to move on. But in this case, we always knew when to move on because as soon as the student laughed, they got into that question. Um, but um, so, I mean, I do think that those are the things that we hear about that I think people like, that it's the reason we keep doing it. And I do think it gives it a kind of longevity. Uh. I'm just going to tell a quick little story about Kenny. Um, so when we got round to doing the second edition, uh, Chris did rather more of the work than I did. So I went to Kelly and I said to Kelly, uh, I think it should be deconsoiled. And Kelly said, no way. Swales and Feek is a brand. <laughs> so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Dolce and Gabbana, Alcorn and Fitch, Johnson and Johnson, Swales and Feek. and feek, um, and I wouldn't change it for anything, but it also means that our obligation to the book has changed over the years. Um, we found out in talking to people that the book is no longer ours in the same way that it was when we first started. When we first started, we could do whatever John wanted. Not so much what I wanted, because I didn't know enough to know what I wanted, but, but there's me in there too. But, but as we went into the second edition, we had to start thinking about that table on page 162, right? And another table that I would have loved to have deleted in the third edition, and then John and I wanted to rearrange the units because we thought we would do a much better job. But every time we would talk to people and say, well, we're thinking about changing, and they go, stop, stop, stop. stop. I don't want to hear another word out of you. Change nothing. Um, so it's been a little bit challenging to help the book uh, grow and evolve as research has changed and as we learn more and more about academic writing. But in the end, our roles as authors, and maybe that's the same for you um, as well, but our, our role is more of one of caretakers of the book, curating the book, making sure that we stay true to our original principles and what teachers really expect. But at the same time, we don't want it to stay the same. So that balance between change and stability is one that's constantly in front of us as we're working on the book. But I'm, I'm shocked at how often people say, don't change a thing, it's perfect. Mm. Yeah, well, there is no perfect text, right, John? Right. right. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name of one of John's papers, by the way. There is no perfect text. Uh, well, there's there's a lot that um, a publisher could say about the the new editions thing. It is really true that I think the author at the University of Michigan Press, our philosophy has been that the authors really we try to give them a lot of freedom on what goes in the first edition. But as it goes on, and if you're lucky enough that it goes on, so I try to remind people of many, 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 many books never make it into a second edition. 
um, let alone a third or a fifth. So y the market is gonna make some demands and you have to find ways to compromise. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, you know, these are really remarkable texts. And, and um, as I was saying, like, there's many other textbook or materials writers in the audience and the ELI has just been, uh, it's just been terrific to see the kind of high quality materials that have come out of this organization. And I think what's also really important is that, that they've mostly, you know, um, in the later stages been books for English for academic purposes. And a lot of publishers totally walked away from that market about 10 years ago because it didn't seem big enough. And yet, of course, um, all the, pot, the students at the higher, ed, higher education level, um, this is what they need. And so um, for academic writing for graduate students, pretty much every R1 institution in the United States uses that book and often in multiple departments. And there aren't a lot of other books that can make that claim. And that just tells you that John was absolutely right. If you build it, they will come. to say one last thing which seems unrelated but is not and that is the role of ELI and authors in the uh, birth of the graduate employment organization the, the TA union um, I mean I like to think that because of the kind of critical thinking we did because of the level of detail we learned to think in because of the research um, we were very very central to the birth of that organization um, I was the founding president Diane Larson Freeman brought out the entire College of Education, the entire of college. Engineering. Of engineering, rather, the E word, of engineering. I mean, um, you know, Mark and Bill Acton were at the, um, the incinerator. You can't be accredited unless your incinerator works. Um, so um, it was amazing work that people did. And, and it felt integrated to what we care about, what was right in the world, and what skills we had. So we are at five o'clock, but I I think we 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 need to okay one and then we I think we have to have a couple of questions from from the audience. Well, this is really a sales pitch. Uh, I am currently working on two volumes, listening and speaking for Spanish speakers in South America, which I will <clears throat> one of these days <clears throat> have some manuscripts to approach the press with. <laughs> with my experience down there, I found that there are specifics of the language that lead to certain kinds of, of things and the ways you go about things. And so now that I've been living down there since 1999, well, I live half in the States and half down there, since 1999, I have a pretty good idea about how Spanish works vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis English. That is más o menos. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a full circle because the very first, free, I'm thinking of, it, yeah. In the 40s, the freeze the, uh, for the, the English course for Latin American students, right? Oh, yes. I mean, that's, yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. boy, that's perfect. Well, as a lecturer here at the ELI, I'm so grateful to Chris and John for AWG. It's a fantastic text um, for teachers. And in regard to reader's choice, I cannot tell you how much mileage I have gotten out of that book. That textbook among native speakers, seventh and eighth grade language arts students who never had heard the difference between a restatement and an inference, who had never read the short story, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. And when they were introduced to that, they were turned on to literature as native speakers at the middle school level. Also, um, graduate students and teachers in Syria were just captivated by the activities in those units. And they used that textbook for themselves to improve their own English. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Noh Jin Kwok. Um, in the uh, 1980s, I was in South Korea studying uh, English with a workbook called Michigan Action English. I just Googled the uh, title and it said University of Michigan English Language Institute. So it must be published by the English Institute. That 
textbook impacted me so much. I learned so much English from working with the It's a cassette tape, it's a listening comprehension. And I knew about University of Michigan for the first time from studying with that book. So ELI is the one that introduced Michigan to me. Now, about 30 years later, I'm a director of the NAM Center for Korean Studies. Also, I'm a chair of the Department of Communication Studies at University of Michigan. So when I studied with the Michigan Action English, I didn't know I would be a faculty member at Michigan, but I can assure you, without Michigan Action English, probably I wouldn't be here. So I want to thank you. I want to heap some more praise on the Michigan press. Um, not only have you done all this, but you've published two of the most influential academic books in anything to do with linguistics. And of course, that's Charles Fries, Teaching and Learning English as a Second Language. I've had graduate students memorize that first chapter. Those nine pages are so full of everything you want to either know or argue against. In, in the whole field. And of course, the second one is Lotto's Linguistics Across Cultures. And I just think the... I, I don't know of any other situation in any other university where a press and a unit have been so closely integrated for so many years. And it's just my feel. I should also say, I suppose, and heap a little praise on myself, there was a time when those two books that I mentioned the, me the press was thinking of cutting them, and I had a long conversation with somebody and maybe helped a little bit to keep them going. So I feel real good about that. And um, the whole idea of the Michigan Press and the ELI together over so many years is such an incredible, academic, pure success story that you all ought to feel real good. What, one more question, maybe? Anybody? Um, you guys talked about, and I, we all know how hard it is, that, um, how many times have I heard someone say, I have a, an idea for a textbook, and I'm gonna. And when I first did my first book, and someone came to the press booth and said, I just done the green workbook, and they said, I'm gonna, I have these same exercises. I'm going to write one. And I thought, oh my gosh, all my work. And then next year, they came at the same TESOL conference. Yeah, I'm gun yeah, you're the gunner person. It's a lot of hard work. Nobody gunners. Nobody ever does this. But I just wanted to thank Kelly Sippel. Because all of you, if you know, these books just they just don't happen. And I work with many other presses where there'll be five people doing what one Kelly Sippel does. And that's because you're amazing. Thank you. Tell the university that. Yes. Well, hear, hear, hear to that. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, Kelly. Thank you, panel, for another wonderful, wonderful discussion. And thank, thank you to all of our panelists. Could we have one more round of applause, really, for just an incredible day? And to you, our audience, who have persevered, I will be very brief. I, I have uh, uh, you know, things prepared to say, but I will do the important business, which is, again, thanking all of those who have helped make today possible, particularly our, e our staff at the ELI. And I want to say particularly thanks to Katie Wyant, who really, this would not have happened without her. <laughs> Diane, John, thank you for your input. Kelly for your input and help along the way. It really was a year-long process, and we, we it, it's just been magical. Thank you, Angela. Well, thank you. I, I, on, I was making notes, of course, all day, and all these themes, and I, what I really want to, what it boils down to for me are a couple of things. One is, um, someone said, you know, in reference to, well, I think someone said on this panel and talking about Kelly, these books don't happen. They don't just happen by themselves. And the ELI did not just happen for over 75 years. This was, this was the work of these generations of incredibly talented, hardworking, collaborative 
people. And I think the real joy of this experience, of this day, was bringing a lot of them back, bringing them together into this room. Uh, my, my administrator, you know, my, my director's side has been frantic and nervous all day. We're running behind schedule. And, but then I step back and I think partly why we're running behind schedule is because in addition to these wonderful conversations going on up here, every time we've gone into the other room to the assembly hall, there have been fantastic conversations going on there. And the, the, the energy and the hubbub and the engagement uh, was just uh, really, really remarkable. And, and it was very hard. You know, I felt like it's sort of in, in the classroom when you've got a fantastic uh, uh, activity that's just really cooking. And then you think, oh, we've got to get on and move along. So, so uh, that's part of the story. And, um, and then I think of, of Joan's comment that uh, when she quoted John F. Kennedy uh, about people making a difference. And uh, I go back to those, the, the film, clip, film clip we saw this morning of those students arriving here in 1953 and their white gloves and, and the men in their suits and ties. And, and I, I just think about, again, these people over time who have made a difference, who have committed themselves to making a difference and continue to at ELI. So uh, uh, it, it's a magical place and it is really, really an honor to be involved here and to do our part to continue that great tradition, uh, innovation and in engagement with the world. Uh, so, so thank you all and, and uh, it's really been something. <laughs>